It's opening day for comics. Hey there, today I have an unboxing video and in this video I'm going to open up an order that I placed with Professor's Comics on Atomic Avenue and this was an order that I placed right after I finished taking my break from ordering comic books. I pretty much went right back to my same sources and placed an order with each of those sources and Professor's Comics on Atomic Avenue is definitely one of those sources that I I look at very often to buy uh, comic books from uh, specifically because the back issues that I'm able to get from Professor's Comics, along with several others on Atomic Avenue, it typically yields a pretty good results in terms of condition. And it's one of these things that I have been trying to evaluate uh, as time goes on. I, I got a message through my YouTube channel uh, recently, and the message was really around comic book resource burnout or a, a burnout from acquiring books or just maybe not really understanding or knowing what are some other resources to consider when buying comic books online because it's possible that the source that was used to acquire books has either run out or changed. And, and that happens too, where you feel like you have a reliable source and then all of a sudden it starts to change. I'll give you a quick example, and that's Hip Comic, where I immediately thought I have a great source for bronze and copper age back issues, uh, specifically Marvel. That's the kind of the era and the brand that I target. And then over time, as I ordered more and more books through Hip Comic, it seemed like the quality of the books got worse over time. And then you feel like, okay, I'm kind of burned out on this one resource. Should I just buy more from the sources that I typically buy from? Should I find other sources? And for me going forward, I think I'm going to double down on the sources that I have trusted over the last three or four years or even previous to that. I think that one source I'm on the fence about is still Midtown Comics. I look at the data and the data is staring me in the face. And when you're talking about books that are considered to be back issues from anywhere from a year ago to five or ten years ago, if somehow you can manage to get these books delivered to you without any damage in transit there's some opportunity there as well. So that's where I'm trying to swallow my pride a little bit on, on that one. Uh, there's other sources that I have left or abandoned. Uh, Things from Another World is another one where the data shows me over time that I still have about maybe a dozen or so online sources for comic books that are reliable in terms of delivering books in high quality, high grade, high condition. And I think I go through this mental process of like, almost not that I'm getting bored with getting books from one place, but I do kind of go through a period where I want to just look at something else just to see, am I missing something? Am I missing something with a different online comic store? Am I missing something by buying from this dealer or this LCS or from a table at this convention? It doesn't really matter to me where you get your comics from, but sometimes I go through this period of, I guess you call it boredom, or, or just sort of this this sort of stale feeling where you're just like, uh, it's another box of comics from the same place. Even though they're different books, there's part of me that just wants to have a variety of comics, but also from a variety of sources. And I just know, having gone through this now for several years and compiling all of this data, that really it's in your best interest to take kind of your top five places to buy comic books and just consistently hit those, consistently buy from, consistently grade, measure, evaluate, press clean if need be, get books graded, and so on, and just stay true and consistent to your own methods and being loyal to those sources. So I'm going to open up this order from Professor's Comics, who I consider to be one of those sources for me, and take a look at a handful of books that I ordered and then at the very end of this video, you'll see what I paid for the books, how the books graded out, and what values these books might have if I were to get them professionally graded. So let's get to the unboxing and see what I picked up. All right, here we go. Here is this order that I placed from Professor's Comics. This was placed in early March of 2023, so let's get it opened up.
All right, got through that homegrown uh, packing uh, with all of that scotch tape. Always an adventure dealing with a tape monster. Trying very carefully to peel the tape off without damaging comics. And let's take a look at the books that I got here. Starting with Silver Surfer. This book is from 1991. Great Ron Lim cover art here with Thanos Silver Surfer. The Universe According to Thanos, the Infinity Gauntlet, Infinity Gauntlet crossover. Lots of great cosmic Marvel goodness here happening in this book. So let's pop it open and see the condition of this one and also get it out of the bag and board with all of the tape on it here. All right, let's take a look and see here. Yeah, staple placement kind of odd there, almost on the front of the cover. A little bit of a soft corner down here, but it looks to be... Probably in a 9.6 already just from the corners, a little bit of a stack increase. Uh, no real visible spine ticks that I can see, so that's good news. Let's take a look at the back. Back looks pretty clean. Um, some ink stains here and there, probably leaning towards 9.4. A little bit of a, I thought that was a tear right there. Could just be some discoloration, but uh, some general creasing. It's To me, it's borderline at 9.2, 9.4. Everything else looks really, really good on it, though. I'd maybe even lean to bump it to 9.4, but I'm sure on a second pass I would probably find some more things. Uh, so probably get just with the inks staining and some other... I always do this. I go back and forth, and when I'm kind of caught between two grades, I just pick the lesser of the two to be safe, so I'm probably going to end up giving this book a 9.2 Silver Surfer 55. All right, there it is in a fresh bag and board, graded officially a 9.2, and I indicated that it could benefit from a clean and press. I don't really think that there's a ton of cleaning that needs to go on, but probably just give the back a wipe down to see if there's any sort of the inking or uh, dirt or any other discolored problems on, on the back of the book could come out with either a light, dry, or wet cleaning. All right, this book, you can see it. Uh, this will be the next one we look at. It's Marvel 2-in-1. Number 40. This is from 1978. It is that Marvel 2-in-1 presents Thing and the Black Panther. These were titles that I never collected when I first got into comic book collecting when I was young. And I didn't really get into the 2-in-1 the Marvel Comics Presents, Marvel Team-Up, Marvel Tales... It always just felt like either like side stories, reprints, and so forth. And now these are actually quite collectible, especially in high grade, as most uh, popular comics are of the, the bronze, early copper. If you have anything that resembles sort of mainstream Marvel or DC comics of that time, and you can have it in high grade, there's a lot of just great hidden value there. So let's take a look at the condition of this. Uh, moving it in and out of the light here, you can see the creasing right here on the left side. So it definitely would benefit from a press. And this is typical of Professor's Comics where the spine looks very, very nice. Fit, like not a lot of color breaks, just general creasing or cracking, if you will, along the, the spine here. Uh, corners kind of soft, just like we saw with Silver Surfer 55, but nothing too crazy or, or too damaging to the book. So you start to kind of see that the same books from the same seller, and again, I trust how they kept and cared for their books, and I'm already thinking 9.6 to 9.4, a little bit of creasing down here on the outer edge, and then the back of the book looks very, very nice. And what I was talking about before around kind of believing in your source, and though it, you might want variety, if you've found a great source for comics, you want to continue to go back to them. And if you compare like the back of this comic with the back of some of the books that I was getting from places like Quality Comics, this would have been just partially covered with foxing, dirt, slime, snot, I mean, you name it. And this really, there's a couple of just general printing defects with ink stains, and then just a lot of general creasing you can see there along, along the spine. So I would love to blast this book with humidity and press it out, and it would probably end up being... Uh, you know, at least a 9.4, if not a 9.6. There's a little bit of dirt here down in the UPC that would need to be cleaned out. The corners, unfortunately, not much I can do with that, so that's where it would max at a 9.6. But a beautiful book, very vibrant colors here. The Thing in the Black Panther, number 40. I think where I'm going to settle is probably, again, a 9.2. I hesitate on that, too. It looks like 
possibly even a nine now that I look at this corner a little bit more. Uh, there's also just a little bit of a fold there. And so there's quite a bit of work on this one that would have to uh, move it up from where I'm gonna leave it as a 9.0 all the way up to a 9.6. I think a 9.0 as is, is a pretty fair grade. All right, here it is. Marvel 2-in-1, number 40, 9.0 clean and press candidate. So great book, 1978, high grade copy, not a key, not a whole lot of desirability and collectability specifically in the art or the story of this book. We've got the thing, we've got Black Panther, we've got mainstream comic characters, yes, but really nothing that's driving a lot of attention to it other than as time passes, the age of these books, the collectability around the presentation and the continued nostalgia, it will continue to hold value. These books are going to have value consistently going forward just because of how more difficult it will be to find them in high grade condition like this and with a clean and press it can even be higher which is great i love uh having access to those tools in this day and age all right next up is web of spider-man 29 i laugh there because i think uh i had uh, ordered this a few times and been disappointed and wanted to go back to a tried and true resource and see if a copy of web of spider-man 29 from Professor's Comics would end up working out more than my more recent purchases where I think this book was landing somewhere in the sevens and eights. And again, it has the same kind of feel, like I can already get used to the feel. And as I move this in and out of the light, you'll see a little bit of a stack increase. Uh, there's some wrinkling I feel on the back, but already can tell this is going to be another high grade copy with a lot of potential. So same thing, we've got just some creasing here it is miswrapped but no color breaks the top has a little bit of kind of cracking some color rubbing possibly although i think some of that is just the art but right in here is what i'm talking about that would have to be smoothed out with a press and it very well could be uh, if we're using a little bit of humidity there the good thing is i don't see a lot of dry cleaning um, these are always tough until i really get working on them i don't know if they're ink stains or dirt uh, but just some light dry cleaning here and there. But uh, gorgeous book, a lot of potential with this one. I feel like I have to give this one probably a 9.4. I'm kind of question mark. I don't believe it is as bad as Silver Surfer 55 in terms of a lot of the creasing. It's a pretty straightforward uh, crease-free cover. But beautiful book, and I think this might be my high-grade copy going forward if I can get this one uh, cleaned up a little bit. Love this book. I love the tie-in here back to Amazing Spider-Man 289. Right in my wheelhouse with Spider-Man versus Wolverine. Just kind of gives me all of those feels and chills of reading those books back when I was a kid. So always love picking this one up from 1987. It's Web of Spider-Man number 29. All right, there we go. Uh, freshly bagged and boarded and graded in a 9.4 with a clean and press indicator. Again, I don't think there'll be a whole lot of cleaning going on, just some uh, some double checking on the back cover, but gorgeous book. Happy I picked this one up from Professor's Comics. And I think already in the 9.4, this is my highest graded copy or the copy in the best condition that I have of Web 29. Next is Wonder Woman number 77. Now I'll say not the most striking or attractive Wonder Woman cover that I've ever seen, uh, especially with these guys kind of lurking on, these ants. But it is a cover by Brian Bolland. And what I typically do when I'm tracking a title or an artist on a title is I will find, you know, did they make a run? A run of covers, a run of interior art. And Brian Bolland's run on the covers of Wonder Woman right around this time frame it, it definitely happened. <laughs> I, I It's difficult for me to say just like how, you know, I don't want to throw the word like iconic around like a lot of people do. Uh, it, it was a memorable run and there are some memorable great Wonder Woman covers, but Balin just had a run of consecutive covers that he did. And so what I'll do is I'll find those issues. I'll track the entire run. And then you can kind of see when you've got everything at a glance and you're looking at values and covers and which covers are considered to be keys just because he did the cover. I try and find the books in between 
It's like, okay, well, Balin did the cover art on Wonder Woman 77, and it's not necessarily a memorable or desirable book. But if you're thinking of, around collecting artists and trying to collect a full run of any artist, then there will always be those completionists out there. And, and I kind of look for those things in terms of trying to find some hidden value. So let's take a look at the condition of this one. A little bit of a, again, just, I don't necessarily know if that's a stack increase or just creasing in general. It just looks like it's been laying on a pile. And I don't know if this was part of the way that it was sandwiched in in transit, but uh, those typically come out very, very easily with a quick press at least. Uh, same as uh, all the others, a little bit of corner wear here. So that's unfortunate, probably already thinking about a 9.6, although this corner is fairly sharp. So I don't think it would go below that just from the corners. Creasing on this side as well that would need to kind of be smoothed out. Sharp, really, really striking yellows in this book. You also don't want to necessarily deny the obvious, which is there are collectors that collect particular superheroes when they're in, let's just say, awkward positions. Um, you know, you have those collectors that collect bondage covers, stuff like that. So there's always that segment of the collecting that you may not be into, but you can't ignore the fact that it is collected or there's value there. So that's another reason why I wanted to pick up a book like this and why I track it just beyond the Brian Bolland art. A uh, little bit of a corner issue there I saw. It's just a slight dog ear there. Again, nothing really outrageous. I think it's really, it's this corner that I'm looking at there. Let's look at the back. Yeah, tough. Mortal Kombat, all black back cover ad from August, September, 1993. Look at this spine though, nothing there. Beautiful, no ticks, no nothing. So there's some light creasing. I definitely would give this a 9.4. Uh, I think it maxes 9.6 just because of this corner. And you can see more of the, what I'm talking about here on the back right there. It's just, it's too soft. I don't even think I can fold it over. It's just what it is. So I think that's that corner alone is probably gonna keep it at a 9.6 max but a really great 9.4 on a solid Wonder Woman 77. There we go, Wonder Woman 77, August 1993, graded a 9.4 with a press for a possible improvement of that book. Next up, we have Avengers 188. Uh, always love this, especially when you're dealing with uh, LCSs and old comics. Uh, you've got the grade, the price up there, near mint, $11.50. Uh, this is pretty cool. It's a 1979 issue. It is a direct edition. It's not a Sharpie that went through the barcode. This is how the directs were, were sent out. But here's something that I noticed right away. I don't know if you can catch it. Just the, the off-centering of this cover is quite ridiculous. So you can see on the bottom here, uh, the black border above the white. This is part of the book. Let me take it out of the bag and board so you can see it better. But uh, man, disappointing again miswrappings and things like that I really really struggle with that I do not like them in general of course if I had a amazing spider-man number one that was slightly miswrapped I don't know if I would really care but when you're dealing with just kind of everyday back issues god just bugs me it's great John Byrne cover but there it is that's what I was talking about and then it affects the top where the the Marvel Comics group is pretty much just cut off so it's not a trimmed cover it's just a misprinted uh, cover so to speak I'm sure it makes the book more rare and more valuable right but looking at the back very similar to the other books I won't spend too much time on it but you could see just ink staining slash minor dirt so it would benefit from a clean and press corners look okay just slightly soft spine looks to be in great shape slight stack increase I think we're seeing some consistency here with the condition, which again, this is a good thing. This is why I do what I do and I buy from the same sources over and over is again, it might be boring, but you are you start to build proper expectations where you can predict the quality of the books that you're gonna get from a seller. So on this one, I can see lots of creases here, uh, especially in the light, uh, probably along the same lines of somewhere between like an 8.5 and a 9.4. This one, it looks great other than the miswrapping. I feel like I've got to lean at least 9.2, if not 9.4. And man, it's really close. This corner too, it's slightly soft, dealing with a bindery tear here. And again, if I can't decide, I just kind of have to go with the lower one. So I'm going to give this one a 9.2 on Avengers 188. All right, so it looks a little bit better in a fresh bag and board, but you can 
also see the miswrapping. Uh, it's more obvious there, but there it is, 9.2 clean and press. And I didn't factor in the miswrapping on it. I do feel like it is close to near mint. Not a book that I would pick up necessarily if I saw the miswrapping or the, the miscutting, misprinting, whatever you want to call it, that badly. I would definitely pass on a book regardless of condition just because this book isn't a major key or grail or anything like that. Uh, the next one also falls under the same category of being a very, very nice solid book, but not a major key. This is Hawkeye number one. This is just a great Mark Grunewald book. He did the cover art, the interior art, and the story. Always reminds me, it's kind of like a parallel book to the Wolverine limited series of around the same early 80s time frame. It just, like from a design standpoint, has a lot of similarities to that. But a lesser character in the Marvel Universe, Hawkeye. But I pick up this book from time to time because issue one in a high grade Actually, all four issues in a high grade are, are have some nice value, but one in particular pops a little bit more than the other three. So let's take a look. The first thing I will say is that the cover is very striking in terms of color. The blues, the purples, the white background, Mockingbird back there sort of straddling that water tower. I'm not sure what she's doing back there, but uh, the colors, even the, the back cover ad, looks like it just came off the spinner rack. This book is from 1983. It does have some sort of like dotting, like ink dots or something, almost like ink got kind of splashed on the cover, but that's a manufacturing defect that wouldn't count against it. Now, this book does have color breaking ticks. Again, hard to see with the, the coloring of this book, but there's one, there's two, there's three. So already kind of dealing probably with a 9.4. And on this one, the corners are a little bit better Soft up here, borderline acceptable. So again, 9.4, now we're dipping into a 9.2 potentially. Then looking at the back, we've got some general creasing, but the back doesn't look too bad. Just a light, light spine crease right in here. So probably leaning 9.2, the spine ticks make it kind of tough because the other books didn't have ticks, but they were more heavily creased. So this one, I almost want to put 9.2 and then just leave it and not put a press candidate. And I think that's probably the difference. And I'll probably leave that as a 9.2, but just as is. And I probably won't spend a lot of time with this. These these ticks could be buffed out, but they, they do break color. So as a professional grader kind of zooms in and looks at these uh, different ticks under the light, it'll see that it, it, I know it's like, well, if it's a white, cover does it actually break the color but you can see it it's just a touch enough of a different color that yes it does break here along the spine of hawkeye number one and here it is in brand new bag and board hawkeye number one in a 9.2 next one we have marvel team up 102 same kind of story around collectability that I discussed earlier with Marvel 2 and 1. So let's just take a look at the grade of this one. This one's interesting too because cover art by Frank Miller, not the most memorable of cover art. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, Rhino. Uh, but pretty cool Spider Man, Doc Samson, Rhino, all drawn by the legend Frank Miller here. And similar to Hawkeye number one, there's just, it's a backgroundless cover. But the colors that are there really, really pop. So that's cool. We've got a lot of the primary colors working right here on this issue of Marvel Team Up. So let's look at the condition. A uh, little bit of, again, either ink staining or just some slight discoloration. Could be a little bit of dirt. It's most likely ink there. This one has a handful of really, really tiny hairline ticks along the spine. Corner, it's tough. It's right on the edge of that border kind of coming up the side there. I think it's okay, but not a perfectly sharp corner. This corner looks all right as well. Back cover looks pretty good. Finger bend on the bottom, that would have to be dealt with. So it definitely needs a press, probably needs a clean and press just a once over, but nothing too drastic. Other general creases, so probably 9.2, although now I'm kind of debating whether or not this book could be improved. It's possible that some of these hairline ticks could come out with some humidity, but I'm not exactly sure. So I don't know if I want to say it's a 9.0 clean and press that could potentially max at a 9.4, or 
or just leave it as a 9.2, not work on it. This one's kind of borderline. The more I look at it, there's more additional creases here along the side that would have to be buffed out. So this is where I'm thinking this could actually be a 9.0. It's tough if you look at it. it. It looks like a beautiful book. It's very well centered. I'm really on the fence with this one. And I think just the more I look at it, it just feels like a 9.0, but definitely a clean and press might help it out. So here we go, Marvel team up number 102. I And I did land on a 9.0 clean and press. And I figured it would be worth just kind of a once over. Uh, it could only maybe get a 9.2 bump, but even then I just wanted to put that down as an indicator as, a, as some potential there. The last book I picked up from Professor's Comics, uh, this is interesting. This is Captain Marvel number 36. And it comes with a certificate of authenticity where this book is stated to have originated from the second Mile High collection and as being one of the highest quality examples of this particular issue they have ever seen. It is packaged in a Mylar protective sleeve. How fantastic. Uh, very interesting. I mean, I could basically replace this book with any book and the certificate is just sort of laying in there. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. It's only held together by scotch tape. It's not like any sort of official seal. And I think it was even taped up once or twice before. So it's not like I'm breaking some certificate here or doing anything that would kind of cancel out or invalidate the certificate. So there's just this external bag and it's just it's sitting in an open mylar here. There's, it's not even sealed. So I am going to take this book out and grade it, but just wanted to point out this certificate that it's kind of cool, came with it. I will keep this with the book, but I am going to replace it. And it's kind of funny. It says it, it it's came with a, a mylar protective sleeve. I mean, again, there's, I mean, so what? It doesn't really do anything for me in terms of... Uh, I don't know, they make it seem like it's a big deal that it's in this sleeve, almost like a, a graded slab before they existed. But let's take a look. Is this truly one of the highest condition copies they've ever seen? I don't know, possibly. I mean, I've seen books in a lot better shape than this. I'm already seeing lots of little creases and dings all over the place. You can see it as I move the light, especially right here along the spine. Looks like it got pinched right in here. Um, it would definitely benefit from a press. Other creasing here in the trade as I move back and forth, right in here, like through the P. Yeah, just, I mean, it's, I always find it kind of silly. It almost feels like a, like it was written by a salesperson or something rather than a, a true authenticator. Uh, the top back cover is pretty rough. So I think all in all, I'm, if I'm trying to land on a particular grade, like I feel like 9.2, it's it's in the realm of, of possibilities, but the more I look at it, it's probably a 9. We've got a soft corner up here that we're dealing with, so I think probably 9.0 is fair. Uh, pages inside looked very, very nice. It looks like white pages inside. That's cool, but you know, it's funny. It's nothing about this book in terms of the condition makes it seem like, wow, I have a real hidden gem here. Um, it's probably just a, a pretty standard book of this age that has very similar but pressable defects. Could this book max out at 9.8? No, I don't think so. Uh, this corner down here as well has a little bit of softening on it, so probably a 9.4 max. Great condition for a book like this, but I think that with some of the other things, more creasing, more corner issues, more dirt, I may even have to settle in at an 8.5. I'm trying not to give it an 8 if possible, but up here is pretty bad. Uh, I think in general, just because there aren't a number of color breaking spine ticks, it's really just right in here is the only real problem. It's just very, very faint right there. It's like hairline in terms of size and width, but a little bit of impact crunching, just too many things going on where I, I just can't, honestly justify the 9.0 on this one. Um, still have a, has a lot of gloss on the cover. Great looking book. Great cover by Al Milgram. But I think I'm going to have to settle in on an 8.5 on this one just because of all the other defects that I uh, came across. But I think it definitely would benefit from a clean end press. All right, here it is, all rebagged and boarded. Uh, very, very cool, Silver Age size, Captain Marvel, 36. I saved the certificate, put it in the back, but I did give it an 8.5 clean impress on this one. 
So very, very uh, happy and proud to own these books, once owned by Professor's Comics himself. Always makes me feel good that I have the opportunity to own books from the Professor's Collection, which probably should have its own certificate at this point because they're all great books. But you could start to see, hopefully, some consistency with the condition, the types of grades, you know, the 8.5 and the Captain Marvel being the lowest, 9.4 being the highest, but all of them having a little bit of a potential to be improved with, I think, a minimal clean and press, which is fantastic. It's These are books that do not require a lot of work, or you could just leave them at the current grade, and they're all still considered to be great, high-grade comic books. Now let me go over the order summary with you so you can see what I paid for these books and check out the values of the books, both raw and if I were to get them professionally graded. All right, here is that order that I placed with Professor's Comics on Atomic Avenue on March 5th, 2023. I was invoiced $63.35 for this order. I had to pay $11.85 shipping and handling for this order. Uh, there was no tax. And then what I end up doing is I take the cost of each book and I distribute the shipping cost across the entire order. So if we look at the total cost for each book, uh, when that is summed up and you look at my total here at the bottom, if it equals the invoice, which it does in this case, 63.35, then my math is correct and I have the true cost to acquire each book. And that's important to me when I'm really looking at a specific book and how much value am I adding to my collection. This is really important to me because when I'm looking at how much actual value am I adding to my collection, if I'm paying a lot of money to have books shipped, I want to figure out the true cost for each book so that I can figure out if I am adding value or I do decide to sell the book later on down the road, I'd like to get some of these additional fees and, and sort of hidden costs I'd like to get some of that money back, essentially. So it's very important to me that I track the true cost door to door for each book. So we can see here the total cost. And if I compare the total cost against column double A here, and this is the raw value add to my collection, when I'm comparing the total cost to acquire the book with the fair market value as provided by cover price. Now, a little disclaimer again about cover price. What I'm doing is I'm taking the highest fair market value and applying it here to this book because my expectation is in most cases I'm placing orders for comic books listed in near mint condition. So I always grab the highest value because if for whatever reason cover price has a book listed at near mint for five bucks but has their fair market value of the same book in very fine and it's 10 bucks, I don't quite understand that. It could be just incorrect data. It could be the the timing of sales, and I don't even quite understand how they still are trying to determine value by condition. But to me, it should be reversed, obviously. The, the near mint copy should have sold for higher than the very fine copy, but I just take the highest value, the highest fair market value, and I apply it here. So that's why it's just cover price fair market value and not necessarily related to a specific condition. Uh, so then I compare column U with column Z, and that gives me the raw value add. Now, the first book here, Avengers 188, I ended up spending almost $13 for that book. Cover price is saying it's a $7 book, so that was the only one that I lost money on from a raw book perspective, lost about 6 bucks on that. But overall, it was a total value add from a raw book perspective of $57.65. So that's great. That's wonderful. I don't intend to necessarily just turn these books right around and flip them and sell them raw. I prefer to see if there's a way to improve the grade or if there's any value in getting them professionally graded and slabbed. But still, it makes me feel good to know that for this particular order, just ordering these books raw, I was able to add value. Now, the Hawkeye number one is kind of standing out for me. $36 for that book, that seems a little bit high. I would probably put that book more around like the seven to $10 range, but it's cover price, it's data. I have to kind of roll with it and be consistent. If it does get updated down the line, then I'll come back here and update it. So it cost me $8.48 to acquire that book. I think that's pretty much fair market value, but it's the numbers are saying it's a $27.52 value add. If we look at something like Marvel 2 and 1 number 40, a $20 fair market value for that book in near mint condition, I could probably get on board with that. Uh, maybe it's a little less, but still we're talking about 
books in high grade from 1978, mainstream Marvel comics. Again, it could be 10 or 15 bucks and not necessarily 20, but it only cost me $5.98 to acquire. So a nice value add of $14.02. Everything was positive here. It's very nice to see Captain Marvel 36 with that certificate of authenticity in air quotes. It cost me $12.48 to acquire. That book also $20. I would believe that that book is a $20 uh, raw book more so than Marvel 2 and 1 and definitely feel like it should have more value than Hawkeye number 1. But not too bad for Captain Marvel 36 from 1975 to get that book for about $12.50. Now, if I were to get these books professionally graded, uh, I want to show you kind of like the low end, the high end, and then the actuals here. So if I'm looking at my grade, again, I'm buying these books in near mint. So I would expect them to be uh, 9.4, right? If, if the seller is able to accurately grade their books and they list them at near mint, then that's what I would expect to receive. In a 9.4... And if we compare this to the CGC value in column AB, if I were to blindly send all of these books off for professional grading and I trusted the seller to deliver on their grades, their, their listed conditions, then I would also add just about $70 to my collection. The Marvel Team Up 102 would have been a significant loss where it wouldn't have been worth grading. Uh, probably same for Wonder Woman 77. Only It's only worth 20 bucks and a 9.4. But some of these books do have pretty good value just in a 9.4. Avengers 188, 75, Captain Marvel 36, 81, Hawkeye number 177, Marvel 2 and 1, 40 at 45, and Web 29 also at $45 in a 9.4. Now, not a lot of value when you're taking a book, buying it for $7, you're pressing it. Are you pressing it yourself? Are you paying for it to be pressed? And I'm going to get into these numbers in future videos too, like the true cost of really acquiring a book, but acquiring it with the intent to improve it, to grade it, and just kind of what those realistic expectations are in terms of cost, because the money that you're spending, it adds up really, really fast. So these numbers are pretty basic, but it gives you kind of a general idea of what I'm talking about. And is it worth going through all of the hassle just to add basically $5 to your collection, right? This is where things don't start to make sense in terms of uh, trying to slab everything and sell everything and get rich off of investing in comic books. Uh, these are great books. They're high grade books. I believe in them. I love collecting. I'm not saying you shouldn't buy them, but I'm also saying don't get too crazy with your expectations on here. Now, Speaking of crazy, let's pretend all of these were 9.8s though. These are the this is the ceiling that I talk about in terms of potential on these books. Is it possible that one of these books could be cleaned and pressed up to a 9.8? After looking at them, I don't know, maybe one in a, a long shot, but I think realistically speaking, they're probably all in the 9294, maybe one or two could be uh, bumped up to a 9.6. But if we're looking at the ceiling, these eight comic books in a 9.8 have a total fair market value after being professionally graded of $1,407.84. And while I am realistic that these books are not 9.8s, what this tells me is that there is still collectability and desirability in these books in high grade. And I do believe that the rising tide raises all ships. I believe in that philosophy. So if you're able to get as high grade as possible, even if it's not a 9.8, you're still going to be adding books of value to your collection with the 9.8 anchor just sitting there. I hope that makes sense, but if you look at Captain Marvel 36 as an example, it has a value of $750 and a 9.8. A lot of that is built into the fact that it's from 1975. It has now a mainstream name brand in Captain Marvel. So the 9.6, 9.4, probably even 9.2, they're going to hang around that 750, obviously a lot less, but it's still going to have value where you wouldn't be necessarily losing money if you were to take a chance and gamble and try to invest in a high grade copy, either in a 9.8 or as close to 9.8 as possible. At least that's my kind of working theory. And all of these books are $100 or more in a 9.8 even in this, this weekend market that we're all currently in at the moment. Some hidden value too. Wonder Woman 77, a great Brian Boland run of covers that I discussed earlier. And this is what I'm talking about as, as far as like finding the in-betweens, the, the books that maybe 
uh, are between the iconic covers or their most memorable. Like if you search for the greatest Brian Bolland Wonder Woman covers, Wonder Woman 77 is not on that list. It's in between the other issues that are on the list. And there it is, kind of proof in the pudding there, 195 in a CGC 9.8 for that book. So uh, collectability there in terms of uh, value and taking advantage of the collecting strategy of collecting an artist or collecting a run that an artist had worked on. Now, I think what would be interesting here before we wrap is to plug in the actual grades and see if there's any CGC values in those grades. So in column S, I just replaced the 9.8s with the grades. I actually assigned the books. And unfortunately, the CGC value in total, if I were to send these books without working on them at all, just they're all going to end up with the grades that I assigned to the books, $64.16 of value lost if I were to spend money to get all of these books graded. So again, I think the whole like slab every comic book and you'll be rich mentality, it does not exist. This is an example of a small sample of books that prove that out. But again, I'm looking at potential. I'm looking at the ability to potentially press and clean these and, and get a, a slight grade bump in them. Now, a little disappointing just as is. Still an average grade across the eight books of 9.11. Still, if you're looking at these books and you're looking at the average grade and you see the 9.11 here and you're thinking, okay, so the average grade across the books, it's about a 9.0 to a 9.2. If the books were worked on and they got a grade bump, it would be 9.2 to 9.4. Now we're kind of getting in the lower end of books having CGC value. And then it just becomes a numbers game in terms of uh, if I were able to get a book pressed into a 9.4 and it has some CGC value that we showed earlier, you know, $75 here, $90 here, $80 here. You know, now we're getting close to that. The $100 mark is usually a pretty good one because if you think, if you're just keeping the math easy and it costs... $25 to grade a book. I realize it's probably a little bit more than that, but just keeping the numbers easy. If your CGC value is 100, it costs 25. You've got a $75 sort of playground uh, to kind of figure out in terms of how much do I want to spend on a book? How much do I want to spend to get it uh, cleaned and pressed? Uh, are there any shipping things happening back and forth? Are there any fees to sell it? So then if you're thinking, well, if I want to spend another uh, 25 to 50 dollars to get all of that taken care of then obviously your margins you know roughly about 25 dollars give or take so that's where then you could tell yourself well if i wanted to add about 25 dollars of value to my collection and i could do that for 10 books at a time again keeping the math easy then for every order of comic books that you're placing when you're buying 10 of the correct books you're adding $250 of value to your collection there every single time, and that will add up pretty fast. But you have to buy the right books, you have to have the right sources, you have to have the history, the trust, uh, and you can see in an order like this, none of these books maybe aren't necessarily jumping out at me. I love Web of Spider-Man 29, so that one always jumps out at me. But if you're really looking at these going, these aren't really all that interesting, they're not that these big keys, if these books are able to move into a 9.4, you're starting to get into that, not necessarily the $100 range, but even in a $75 range. And you could see I, I wasn't spending $25 or $30 to acquire each of these books. We're talking about $5 here, $6 here. So really, there would be that, that $20 to $30 value margin that I'm talking about adding across uh, that could potentially work itself out. Because I believe in the seller to provide not only high-grade books uh, in an honest fashion, very, very fast shipping, great communication, the whole thing uh, with Professor's Comics, but also hopefully, and this was kind of the, the point of this specific video, is that when you're going through and you're seeing me actually grade these, it's almost like you're seeing the same grade, the same condition. And I, while I didn't apply the exact same grade, just because it was, if one book had three creases, the next one might have had seven or eight, and that's what moved the, the grade in a certain way. But if I were able to press all of these precisely the same, I think they probably would, for the most part, all kind of end up in the same 9.4 space, possibly 9.6. But again, the point was that I trust the seller to always kind of deliver books in a very similar and consistent condition. And that helps me forecast future orders. Thanks for watching. Happy collecting and see you next time.